Well, good morning and welcome to Zen Live. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to pick up where we were yesterday. I hope you're following along this Dharma trail, uh, like E.T. picking up M&Ms. We don't know where it's going to go, but we're uh, excited and interested in the discovery of what we find along the way. So yesterday, we were looking at the, uh, the shift in center, uh, and uh, the, the, what, this, this is not, um, it's taken me a lot, many years really to understand this, my whole life perhaps, <laughs> but we really underestimate the need to have a center that holds the world that we perceive together. Uh, the best example is the hub of a wheel, and the, the wheel will not just fall apart without the axis. Uh, these mandalas of the center, the circle with the dot in the middle, is ancient. It's a symbol for the, the center, and, and without a center, we don't even, we don't have consciousness. Just think about that for a minute. Uh, your sense of me as an I holds your consciousness together. Everything that, that, is a, that is the hub of the wheel and every perception that you see is a spoke coming in. And so every, every one of us is a, is a world wheel with a center that is an I. And then from the I, everything that we perceive in the wheel is an it. So this is an I, and everything out here, everything we see is an it, you see. And, uh, but, th but there are two aspects or views of consciousness, like heads and tail of a coin. One coin, two, two sides. One view, one side of consciousness, is the center as the knower. I know, I know it's raining. Well, I know what? I know it's raining. So there are two aspects here. I know, which is the I center, and then it. Well, in this case, it, it is raining. So I know it. So these two create consciousness but they're incompatible. I know, and then when I know something, there's it. So this, there is a shift. Uh, anyway, I've run out. I'm trying to pick up yesterday, I'm running on. So let's stop right there. But we're, we're the, the idea we want to establish from yesterday, before we move on, is that everything is changing. The world is changed. You can't fix the world. Everything, Buddha says, everything is impermanent. Everything is a river. So even the Greeks uh, uh, said you can't step in the same river twice. You see, uh, there's nothing permanent. So when, when times start changing, when times are changing, as Dylan said, the center can't hold. Uh, we lose our fixed sense of reality. It's like an earthquake. An earthquake is the loss of center. And it creates panic because everything is moving, even you. <laughs> There's nothing that isn't moving in an earthquake. Well, in life, that's way life is a rolling earthquake. Reality is a rolling earthquake. So we're constantly trying to fix it so we don't get sick. You know, if you ever go to sea and get seasick, the reason we get seasick is because we lose our center. The ground on a ship is shifting. So, now this, this is a great image, uh, uh, if I have time to do it, but imagine a plate. This is the ground, this is the ship, this is reality. This is you. Now reality is moving. Well, it doesn't want to roll, right? So, get over there. <laughs> All right, the ship is moving, and this is the center. This is you. 
So when the ship moves, the peanut is looking to find that center here, see, here it's center. If the, if the world starts changing, I start moving, the center starts moving to restore center, to get that balance back in the middle. But it can't find it because the circle is moving. So when this happens, uh, we, we experience a vertigo. We talked about that movie Vertigo. Uh, we, we, we experience a, an anxiety. I've lost my boundary. I've lost my ground. I've lost, I'm not sure where, what certainty. I've lost security. I've lost my center. See, that's feeling of uh, everything is in flux. Um, and this happens in everyday world and in big things, you know. It's the same, it's the same thing, whether it's a, uh, a historical shift or whether it's uh, I lost my car keys. The same formula. If you lose your car keys, that's a stabilizing center. When I have my car keys, I can get around, you see. Uh, that's, I, so I am, that fixes me. But if I lose the car keys, I've lost my center that fixes me, and now I'm running around trying to restore center, which is finding the car, car keys. So this is a very everyday thing, but we, need, you know, we can understand it in a larger context and, and to see why we suffer, why we have anxiety, why we, why we feel uh, insecure. So the question right now is, what we're looking at is, when things change, when I lose my car keys, something has changed. I lost the car keys. Um, but, we, but we need, we have an urgency to restore center, which is restoring reality to our fixed assumption of what it is. So we're looking at now um, how it is that nations and ourselves uh, restore the center. How do we fix the center? How do we restore security? One of the ways is that we find an enemy. So that's what we're going to look at today is uh, when the center shifts to the enemy. Now this, I was just watching World War I uh, PBS series, yeah, and I think I talked about this, but this was a fascinating series because it was a classic stalemate, like a tennis match, where both sides are mass or have the same skills. Now that ten and sometimes these tennis, the tennis match will, could go on for a day until one blinks. It's like two tomcats facing off. They'll stay there forever until one blinks or they go at each other with fury. So when they go at each other with fury, if they're both equal, the fury can last, which happened in the First World War. The fury lasted for four years. And it was like a vortex in which each country just poured all of its, all of its, uh, men into it, into a great death maw, into Kali, into, into this death, and they just rushed to it, going over the top into the vortex of no man's land. You can see it like this waves, to, like an ocean eating itself, like, like life eating itself, two sides flowing into death in an endless consumption of itself. This, which is represented by the, my favorite image, is the dragon eating itself. Or you see like two koi fish, but one, each is chasing the other to consume the other so it can be the one. So this, so let, let's, let, let's look at it from this point of view. There are, um, when the center shifts, when the center becomes unstable because of change, there is a need to restore the center. And the formula for restoring the center is finding an enemy. And so if you find an enemy, you can fix your center, your me or yourself, 
fix me, let's put it this way, fix me on it. So the enemy then becomes that which stabilizes me and I become the greater the enemy, the stronger I become. We can watch this happen on Facebook. Uh, so you're typing along, blah, 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 and you put out an opinion, which is me. And somebody says, well, that's silly. <clears throat> what? That's silly? Well, then what about this? And so you, you go through a rational tennis match, and then when they're both logics, both logic is uh, equally strong or ungiving, then, then you resort to name-calling. And these can go on for days. Uh, you can't break it up. You can drop in there and say, you two guys are like Tomcats. And they'll say, get out. Or, <laughs> and they just keep on going. You know, finally, they just one up, they just quit from exhaustion. Or one of them pulls out the nuclear option and defriends the other. But it's funny, you see. But that's like a little teeny formula for the World War I. You see, you sit with the butterfly flaps and creates a tornado over here, you see. So we're constantly having little World War Ones uh, uh, on Facebook, and it's, uh, we like it. <laughs> but we don't understand it. Uh, because it's not, it becomes painful when you're called an idiot. Or when the other side does not recognize your logic. And the other side, your opponent, does not uh, play the same rules of logic you're playing, uh, you see. Or they're stubborn. They can't see the truth. You know, that drives you crazy. So, <laughs> but the point is that we build our sense of me, our strong sense of center, by having a good enemy. If there was no... So, so the... the um, the point is that the sense of me is based on being unique. I am unique. That is the fundamental uh, form, uh, axiom of me. Uh, we can look at this. You know, we can. You have to. Don't just believe me. Just start looking at yourself. Me, I am me, means I'm unique. There's no other like me. There has never been anybody like me, and there never will be anybody like me. The me, the sense of I, is I'm a unique uh, individual. Therefore, I'm valuable. If I just blend in like a marble with everyone else, I have no value. But the other commandment that is equally valid and must be obeyed, the two commandments of life, one of them is I am a unique thing, I'm an individual, and the other commandment is I must belong. In other words, in other words, Nothing stands alone. So if I am a unique me, okay, but I can't stand alone. I'm, I, have to, the, I have to be a part of the whole. You see, I can't be, unless I want to go live in a cave in Idaho. <laughs> you see, I want to belong. But even there, 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 is a, there is a commandment to belong. We want to belong to a family. You want to belong to a nation, you want to belong to a, a religion, uh, a club. Uh, human, human beings are tribes, they're families, they're relationship. We are relationship. Everything is in relationship. So you cannot deny relationship. And relationship means belonging. You get married, you belong to a, a relationship of a couple. You belong to each other. So you can't, you know, deny this. And that imperative to belong is equally as strong as the imperative to be unique. However, they're incompatible. Uh, so, we usually, 
we, we, we usually get through this by trading back and forth. In a marriage, for instance, you, you have an arrangement where I'm in, I know what to do, I, I know how to fix the car, so I'm unique, I know how to fix the car, and the wife says, well, I know how to fix this dinner, so she's unique there. So each one gives uniqueness to the other in different situations. But what if one person feels insecure, their center is weak, so they need to keep shoring it up. So there is a drive to be unique and make the other belong to them. Now you get into situations of abuse and whatever. So when this unique, the drive to be I am unique, um, is dominant, it's going to make, it wants to make everyone belong to it or submit to it as a affirmation of my uniqueness. And so here you get into this relationship of me will become me when the other submits to me. That is the way I become me, is by making an enemy fit or submit or bow or just be removed from the playing, from the game. So that I will be unique and I am the one that has no second. So that's one commandment gone mad. <laughs> but, but we still have to answer the other ones, so how I must belong. So, Nash, so let's look at uh, uh, say na let's look at on a um, political scale. Uh, nationalism. So the rise of nationalism, which is which we're into right now in the world, there is a there is a rising of nationalism in Europe and in the world. Uh, North Korea is nationalism in the sense that uh, they want to be the unique Korea and make the South Korea submit to them. That's been going on now for 70, 50, 70 years, I don't know, since the 50s. So you have this uh, nationalism is a, comes about when the center is uncertain, when there is change going on, like globalism. Globalism is changing the paradigm. So there is, in globalism, there is a loss of our separate sense of national me. Trump ran on this, restore America first, nationalism with Bannon, uh, which also draws into it other uh, problems, but the whole idea is to restore the center to a people who feel uncertain and insecure because the whole ship is moving and I, I'm getting sick, you see. I'm getting seasick in globalism. Everything is moving. So there is a, we got to fix the center and we're going to fix the center by creating an enemy because when you have an enemy that is, um, uh, worthy, you fix your center on the enemy. Now Bush did that when 9-11 came. 9-11 was a loss of center, loss of the towers. That was the, it was the loss of America's belief in its invulnerability. Up until 9-11, the oceans protected us, you see. In World War II, uh, they got the enemy got on the shore, but there was no invasion. So, the the 9/11 uh, uh, was basically an attack uh, and a destruction of the secure center, the tallest buildings, the pair of opposites, the two towers, the financial center, by some bearded guys with back box cutters. Well, there was a loss, this was a trauma, and Bush restored center by declaring war on Iraq, which was a worthy enemy because they had an army. 
So it restored center, and America felt good again. And we got, boom, we we're going to do it, you see. So that, restore, that was a way we restored center by finding, uh, but the, of course the after effect is that we're still, <laughs> we're still trying to restore the center of the, na of, the sea, of, the, of, of the region that we destroyed. We destroyed their center, and that let loose, that loose let, let, let loose or released the Kraken, you see. Now there is a fragmentation of the centers, and all of these new centers are struggling to restore center. So ISIS is a struggle to restore their center. So you now in Syria, restore center. So all of these areas are trying to restore their center, you see, uh, because everything is in flux. But the, the uh, how, so how, how, how does nationalism, see we have to obey both of these commandments. So how can you be unique and belong at the same time? Well, politics, religion, uh, nationalism solve this impossible, solve the dilemma of obeying simultaneously two opposite commandments. So if I join a group or a nation or a religion or a church or a cult uh, or a family or any group that says it's unique, then I can belong to that group, I satisfy this commandment, and I also satisfy the commandment of being unique. So I am a unique group. Now I belong, and I can be unique at the same time. I have my cake, and I can eat it too. But this unique group can only exist by having someone else that challenges it. <laughs> because, in other words, the, the unique group exists by having an enemy. And the bigger the enemy, the bigger the, my group gets. So it's ironic that, uh, you know, America, after watching World War I, it became the most powerful uh, nation in, uh, in the European theater uh, by creating an army to defeat the great enemy, the Kaiser. And that enemy was even within. We talked about this yesterday, uh, that the uh, uh, whole, I was surprised that, that America became uh, prejudiced against, radically prejudiced, you know, violently prejudiced against German Americans. Anybody with an accent was tarred and feathered. Uh, if anybody spoke out against the war, they were put in jail. Uh, complete abolition of the free speech. So this... America came out of World War I uh, stronger than anybody. And then the same thing happened again in World War II. Uh, World War Twenty, you know, the whole, basically World War II was just a rerun of World War I. But, uh, so then we wrote, we became even stronger out of World War II. And uh, then I was watching Hidden Figures the other night, and that was about the, uh, the rise of Russia. After, see, after World War II, boy, am I getting far apart, but I'm just <laughs> trying to point out some larger issues here. So the Cold War came in and replaced World War II when we were the strongest, and then Russia said, no, we're unique. We are unique, so we fly Sputnik. And then that created uh, Kennedy and the drive to the moon. No, we're going to go to the moon first. We will be unique. So all of this is a drive of being unique uh, through belonging to a unique nation. So whenever nationalism always says, we are the one, we are the unique ones, we are the chosen ones. So religion gets into that. Every religion restores center. Religion is about restoring your center. And every religion has a center. Uh, Jesus and, and uh, the church is the center, a, a fixed center around which religion goes. So. Uh, we can create a devil and make that the center around which we go. Or sin. We can focus our whole life on getting rid of sin. But uh, usually people that do that end up in some public toilet sinning. <laughs> <laughs>
So we can see this formula everywhere we look, uh, from Facebook to our families to uh, national movements to right to politics today. It's all right there, uh, and it's and it's uh, it's always it's interesting to me to understand the laws or the operating system of my, not only my own consciousness, but the world is mind, you see. The world is not things. The world is, we live in a world that is mind. And so Jesus, will close with this, Jesus comes along and says, love your enemy. What? Because it's you. So just in that very simple uh, statement, Jesus cracks the nut here. The enemy that you are using to make yourself great is you. So if you want to uh, discover peace, you have to love the enemy that you have created and that you have created so you can be separate and it's your separateness that is your suffering. So the great irony is that the irony of peace is that if we have an enemy that makes us strong, if we remove the enemy, we would also remove ourselves. When the fight ends, the me dissolves. So it was the me that keeps me growing and feeling strong. And we can see that happening right on Facebook. Uh, it happens everywhere if we can look at it. So the difficulty of looking at it is that me doesn't want to look at it because the, the ignorance of this formula makes me feel like me. So why do I want to look and dissolve me? Because there's a fear that if my fight with the world or with my enemy dissolves, I will dissolve. And that's true. But the fear is that I would not exist. And that is not true. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll see you at martini time this evening.